I shall be an autocrat. That's my trade. And the good Lord will forgive me. That's his. Hello everyone. It is time for a new history class. And tonight, my guest, Miss ASMR, and I would like to take you to the palaces of St. Petersburg, the shiny domes of Moscow, the vast lands of Imperial Russia in the 18th century. We're going to tell you about a woman whose life looks like a novel. She betrothed her husband. She became Russia's one and only ruler for more than 30 years. She became a patron of the arts, embracing the ideas of her time, the philosophy of enlightenment. She pushed away Russia's frontiers, and she lived a life of pleasure, collecting lovers until her very last years. And these are just some aspects of this remarkable character we are going to discover in this video. So it's now time for you to adopt a comfortable position, to relax, as our journey to the past is about to begin. I may be kindly, I am ordinarily gentle, but in my line of business, I am obliged to will terribly what I will at all. Our story begins in 1729, in Germany. As you may know, Germany, prior to its unification in the 19th century, was a collection of small and mid-sized states, some of them bigger, like Prussia, Bavaria or Saxony, but there were dozens of them, small duchies, principalities, city-states, and it is in one of these small principalities, called Anhalt Zerbst, that a young princess, whose birth name was Sophie von Anhalt Zerbst, the future Catherine II, was born. Anhalt Zerbst was a respected name among the German aristocracy, but not a particularly prestigious one, given the small size of their estates. The Anhaltserbsts were Protestant, like the entire aristocracy in the north of Germany, and her destiny seemed to be to be married one day to another family of the same rank in Germany or Scandinavia. However, she received a very good education, learning foreign languages, philosophy, history, and it seems that during her childhood she proved a very smart and curious child. When she was still a teenager, her destiny was oriented by her mother. Sophie's mother had big ambitions for her daughter, and she started to position her daughter as a possible wife to the future Tsar of Russia. Why that and why Russia? Back then, in the 1740s and 1750s, the ruler of Russia was an empress, Elizabeth. Half a century earlier, Russia had begun to emerge as a great European power, especially with the impulse given by Peter I, also known as Peter the Great, Peter I had been a reformer and a modernizer. He had tried to open Russia, which was previously a very closed country. He had founded a new capital city, St. Petersburg, on the Baltic Sea, which had replaced Moscow as the political capital. And since then, Russia had been increasingly involved in European affairs. But even though things had started to change, Russia remained fairly isolated because of the distances 
it was very far, and Russia was already a gigantic country. Because of the religion, Russia was the only independent large orthodox country in the world. Internally, the power of the Tsars was never perfectly assured, neither. There were considerable forces that could challenge the power of the Tsar, such as the Orthodox Church, the aristocracy that was very powerful, and millions of peasants, the bulk of the Russian population, who lived in very tough conditions and could always revolt. Serfdom had not been abolished in Russia yet, so the peasantry lived like in medieval times in Western Europe. The serfs belonged to their lord, they were not free to dispose of themselves, and most of them lived in great poverty. These masses were a big threat to the power. Riots were still possible, they could revolt for themselves, or they could be manipulated by their lords to revolt against the central power of the Tsar. Finding a foreign wife for the Tsar was a way to ensure that no Russian aristocratic family would find too much leverage and claims that could challenge the power of the ruling dynasty. But finding a wife abroad was not that easy because of the religious difference and because large kingdoms in Europe like Austria, France, Spain, England saw little interest in uh, having a royal marriage with Russia that was too far away to offer diplomatic advantages. So the Tsars had to look for uh, more modest aristocrats and they could find some in Germany which had so many ruling families in all these small principalities we uh, talked about before. Sophie's parents knew that, her mother in particular. As soon as her daughter approached the age she could be married, she started sending portraits of her to the Russian court, to Empress Elizabeth in St. Petersburg, hoping that it could help to seal a deal and lead to a very prestigious marriage for the Anhalpsevs family. And it worked. This is how Sophie von Anhalpsevs became the new future empress of Russia. She traveled to St. Petersburg to meet with Empress Elizabeth and her future husband. She made a good impression and arrangements were made to prepare the marriage. Even though the ambition was initially her mother's, Sophie embraced it and did everything she could to please the Empress and marry her heir. Very early we see a fierce ambition in this woman. When she wanted something, she did everything it took to get it. And in that case, it meant becoming Russian. She converted to the Orthodox faith, which was necessary to marry the future Tsar. She changed her name to Yekaterina, Catherine. She learned to speak Russian, and she spoke quite well. And she did everything she could to learn the customs and the history of her new country. However, the first meetings with the future Peter III, her new husband, were certainly not very engaging. Physically, Peter was not very attractive, but more importantly, he had a very difficult personality. He had been an alcoholic since uh, he was a teenager. He was not particularly smart, and at the Russian court, Many people worried about his capability to run the country one day. Even long before his aunt, Empress Elizabeth, was dead and he became Tsar, he managed to alienate 
many people from the church, from the aristocracy, from the military. He showed a lot of admiration for the king of Prussia, Frederick II, and having been raised outside Russia, he did not even consider himself Russian, and stupidly said it, which uh, meant that he was very little popular with uh, a large part of the Russian aristocracy and military. Catherine would take advantage of this later, when Peter would become Tsar, to uh, participate in a coup and uh, seize power. So, very quickly, the two uh, newlyweds were so different, and Peter was so difficult, that uh, hatred began between them. They almost never lived together, and did everything they could to uh, spend the least possible time together. Both had lovers. Catherine started at a young age to uh, collect men. We'll talk about that later. She became pregnant and had a son, Paul, certainly not from Peter Romanov, the future Tsar. And uh, when Empress Elizabeth died in 1762, the couple Peter III, the new Tsar of Russia, and his wife, Elizabeth, rised to the throne. Peter III's reign was going to be very short, and just a prelude to the reign of his wife. You philosophers are lucky men. You write on paper. And paper is patient. How fortunate Empress that I am. I write on the susceptible skins of living beings. Peter III had one of the shortest reigns in the history of Russia. I told you before he had alienated quite a lot of people even before becoming the Tsar. And when Empress Elizabeth died, Catherine was in her early thirties back then, the couple rose to the throne. Peter III proved a, an even clumsier Tsar than her. He immediately passed laws that displeased the uh, clergy, the church, and the aristocracy, and he took the decision to withdraw from the Seven Years' War, even though Russian armies were victorious, and he took this decision because he was a great admirer of Frederick II. The armies of Prussia had been defeated, and Russia was besieging Berlin, but in order to avoid a defeat to his idol, and against the interests of the very country he was in charge of, he abandoned the war, strongly displeasing the military. The two sovereigns lived separately, they just couldn't bear each other. And because Peter III was so unpopular, a group of aristocrats and generals gathered around Catherine to prepare a, a coup a regime change. The initial project was to make Catherine the regent of the country until Paul's maturity. And even though Catherine did not initiate this project, she clearly did nothing against it. And actually one of the leaders was her lover at the time, Grigory Orlov, an aristocrat she would uh, cover with favors. A part of the army revolted against the Tsar. He was thrown into a jail, and a few weeks later, in circumstances that remain unclear to this day, he was murdered. Catherine now had all the power in her hands, but nobody would have imagined back then 
that this was just the beginning of one of the longest and most brilliant reigns in the history of Russia. During her entire reign, Catherine tried to turn Russia into the greatest possible power, and she also tried to make it a referee in European conflicts. More power meant more territory, and she expanded the frontiers of Russia in the 70s, 80s, and even the 1790s, to the south towards Ukraine and Crimea. There were wars with the Khanate of Crimea, which was under Turkish influence, the, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, were declining by then, and Russia took advantage of it to seize large territories, giving it access to the Black Sea. On the west side, Russia intervened a lot in Polish affairs, placing one of Catherine's ex-lovers on the throne of Poland, Stanislav Poniatowski. In the 1780s and 1790s, in three steps, Poland was finally partitioned between three powers, Austria, Prussia and Russia, and Catherine actively participated in the partition, annexing the eastern half of Poland that would remain Russian territory until the First World War. Towards the east, towards the Pacific, because the Russians had already colonized Siberia in the previous century. The expansion continued, and it is during Catherine's reign that the Russians established bases and claims in Alaska, creating the colony of Russian America. Internally, too. Catherine tried to develop the economy, to create manufactures, to help improve the productivity of agriculture, trying to implement in Russia modern techniques that were used in Western Europe, continuing the work of uh, her predecessor, Peter the Great. When she died, Russia remained a bit backward in comparison with the rest of Europe, but not as much as when she accessed to power, which makes her reign a period of economic catch-up for Russia and relative development. Men make love more intensely at 20. But to make love better, however, at 30. We already mentioned a few of Catherine's lovers, only just a few because there were many in her life. She had a tremendous appetite for men, which started early and uh, never really ended, except in the very last month of her life. However, she never mixed politics and love, and always retained the power only for her, not sharing them at all with any of her lovers, except maybe the most uh, important one in her life, a general called Potemkin, who also served as an advisor. Actually, if we mention two important lovers, her life. The second one was Potemkin, and the first one was uh, Grigory Orlov, Count Orlov, who participated in the coup that put her in charge of the country, and uh, remained with her for several years after she had access to power. But there were plenty of them, and in order to not be disappointed by their sexual performance she had them tested before by uh, friends or 
other aristocrats that were in the confidence. Some of them stayed just for weeks, other for months. Only the two ones I mentioned before, four years. But she was quite grateful with all of them and covered them with uh, titles, land, serfs that were offered to them after they had fallen from grace. It seems this lifestyle never gave her any problem with her conscience. After all, she was just replicating what so many kings had been doing or were still doing in their country. It is just less uh, common because she was a woman. And she was not a very pious person, neither. She was certainly interested in making the distinction between good and bad, philosophically, intellectually. But she was never that much interested in the God and religion. As we said earlier, she had no problem in converting from Protestantism to the Orthodox faith. And during her life, even though she showed respect to the religion, like any sovereign of her time, her policy was to reduce as much as possible the influence of the Orthodox Church in Russian politics. The usage of torture is contrary to all the dictates of nature and reason. Even mankind itself cries out against it and demands loudly the total abolition of it. Early in her life, and even before becoming empress, Catherine was interested in philosophy and she maintained contacts with various philosophers, especially French philosophers who were flattered by her interest and exchanged a lot of mail with her. There was something a bit paradoxical in seeing an autocrat in a country that was extremely different from the ideas proposed by the Enlightenment with ideals of individual liberty equality of rights that uh, contrasted a lot with the situation in Russia, a country where serfdom still existed and that was based on a very strict hierarchy of the society. It was uh, almost impossible for someone to move from one social class to another in such a system. Actually, Catherine understood very well the potential threat of uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment for an autocracy like uh, Russia. And uh, even though she appreciated contacts with philosophers, she never tried to uh, apply too much their ideals to Russia. But still, she made uh, attempts, for example, in terms of education. She uh, opened or contributed to open many schools in large Russian cities. She tried to improve education. And uh, for these reasons, she is considered like one of the models of what historians call the enlightened despot, autocrats from the 18th century that were interested in modern philosophy and tried to apply it a little bit in their countries even though this had obvious limitations. She also turned into a patron of the arts, and more and more as time advanced. She had palaces built. She was a great supporter of neoclassical architecture and art in general. She created personal collections that are still for a part visible today, they provided the basis for the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. The Hermitage Museum is one of the largest in the world. It is in the buildings of the ancient Winter Palace in the heart of St. Petersburg. 
and the basis of the collection that was expanded later, of course, comes from the works collected by Catherine. I am one of the people who love the why of things. In 1796, age 67, Catherine the Great died. Russia would continue with its tumultuous history, engaging in Napoleonic wars shortly after her death. And then in the 19th century, until the Russian Revolution, trying to maintain this autocratic regime in a society that had a hard time adapting to modern times. But she remains remembered as a particularly clever sovereign, a courageous one, that tried to do the best for her country, even though she did not really manage to turn it into what she would have dreamt. And still today, she is remembered in Russia and everywhere in the world as one of the most remarkable sovereigns in the, the history of her country, but maybe even the history of the world. We hope you enjoyed this introduction and uh, strongly encourage you to learn more. I'm going to put a few links to other biographies in the description if you liked this one. And uh, I'll see you soon for another video.